Okay, I gotta, we better get going because we got 45 minutes. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Edwards. Uh, I'm a senior man development manager at IHS. Um, I am not here to sell anything. I'm not a consultant. I'm an agile practitioner. I come to these conferences because I like talking to people. I like learning from people. So after this talk, I encourage people to come up to me. I want to understand more about what people's experiences are, if you can take anything away from this. Uh, how does this work in your context? So disclaimer, this is not a talk on architecture. Um, I'm here today to talk about leadership. What I'm really going to talk about is how this architect role fits into an agile organization. So uh, there's a lot of questions. You know, if you think, if you look at the agile manifesto, it doesn't really talk a lot about this architect role. It talks about team self-organization. We want to empower teams. We want to give them control. Uh, that seems a little bit contradictory with this concept of this, this uh, architectural architect sitting on his uh, ivory tower, making decisions, generating large documents, encouraging large backs, batch sizes. So is there really a place for this architect role in an agile organization? So I'm not here to talk about what I think your organization should do. What I'm really talking about today is, is our experience, my experience in this role, um, I'm hoping that some of the things that we tried, you can take back and give a try on your own. Um, so you just, I want to set the stage a little bit of our context. We're a relatively small group within our organization. IHS itself is 8,000 people, but our part of the organization that was working on this product uh, is about five teams. Uh, it's a pretty good mix. Each team sort of had their own uh, mix of uh, uh, their development, pra their, their process within their team. Uh, we are a thick client desktop application. Uh, it's a uh, engineering platform for petroleum engineers. Written in C++. The code base is fairly old. The product itself was fairly new, but it's built on a code base that's, you know, 30, some of the code in there was written 30 years ago. And we recently adopted Agile. So this, this story is a few years old now, but when, but when it started, we had just uh, started doing an Agile transformation. And uh, the, main, the main story uh, revolves around a major project that we had, which was to take our thick client and convert it to a distributed database platform, a multi-user platform. So we started, we started uh, our, our journey with these, this new Agile transformation. Uh, we really wanted to be pure to our Agile principles. We, we, were, we wanted to uh, empower teams to self-organize. We wanted to give them control. So our first approach to architecture was totally hands-off. We, we formed feature teams, we gave them projects, and we gave them full autonomy. Yeah, we, we believe this Agile Manifesto says that we should, leaders should really step out of the way and give the teams the space to get the job done. And we actually saw some, some uh, good results with this. Uh, we had some projects that were, that were pretty uh, well-defined. Uh, they, they were in our skill set, so you know, maybe it was an enhancement to an additional feature or a new feature that was uh, you know, another engineering feature. Or, or, uh, but what we found was on this new project, this new multi-user project, required skills that we didn't have in our organization. We never had anyone that had worked in distributed systems. Had to, no, no one in our organization had ever had to deal with things like database concurrency. And the same approach of just handing this project to the teams doesn't really work. People, people were actually getting frustrated. The project was, was having trouble getting off the ground, and people were getting frustrated. They were actually screaming at us for help. And the Agile Manifesto this, this was a piece of the manifesto I think we, we kind of ignored. It says, build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need, and trust them to get the job done. So these people were not motivated. They were frustrated. They were, they, people actually dreaded working on this project, and we were not giving them the support they needed. So this was this first realization we had about this architect role is that this concept of empowerment, we want to we wanna just take our hands off the wheel and, and give teams the space. There's a little bit more to it than that. We need to provide them with tools. We need to provide them with skills, training. 
And we need to figure out a way to do this without sacrificing our agile values. Maybe, maybe this really is a time, we said, for having someone taking a higher level view and finding a way, finding a path forward. But how do we do this without this person becoming a command and control design authority? Okay, so, so I was actually tasked with doing this. Uh, the reason for that was I had been on the project a long, I'd, I'd worked on this product a long time. I had a, a pretty in-depth knowledge of the code base and I'd been involved with some of the lead up of the project so I had a lot of the context. So it kind of made sense that uh, I'd be given this, this task. And I really needed to answer how do I do this? I wanted to avoid this. I wanted to avoid me uh, doing a huge amount of upfront architecture work um, and then throwing this you know, large design document to the team. And I also wanted to avoid becoming the, the, the boss, the guy who specifies standards that everyone must follow. Um, but what we really need realized is that rather than a, a you know, military commander, what we needed was someone who could scout ahead. Someone who could look, look down the backlog, look for you know, challenges that are coming down the pipe, do some investigation and then feed a stream of information to the team, someone who's a servant to the team, someone who's not an authority figure. So we arrived at this concept of the architecture scout. And the scout, and, and this idea is that, that the teams still own their designs. The scout is there to provide information, they are a service. Now I did some large, I say not large design, but I did do some documentation. This wasn't totally just a, a, uh, a prototyping or, or a information gathering thing. I did do some, you know, I figured out what are the layers of the system. Uh, I fed the team some design documents. You know, here's the responsibility of these layers. But primarily the way I communicated information to the team was through prototypes and examples. Um, the teams use these prototypes as templates to work from. So whereas before, they're struggling, they, they have no idea where to get going, but now they've got something to look at. They can use these examples as templates for their next work. And the teams really uh, hit the ground running with this. We, we saw velocity improve almost immediately. Morale was improving. People were excited to work on the project. We were getting things done. This was really, really great for a time. So here's the five teams and here's little old me architect guy figuring all this out and this is a little bit of a representation of the communication structures that we had. I was feeding information to the teams and if people had problems they'd feed them through me. I would come up with some solutions. I would help them out. But the teams themselves weren't really communicating. And occasionally teams would have to consume each other's work. We're building this system so we've got modules and they need to com consume the modules each other's have built. But maybe one team has a different idea of how things should be designed than another. And what we started seeing was conflicts forming between the teams. So here's an example. Uh, you know, uh, one team consumes another team's work and he says, oh, this is really poorly designed. It's got like a thousand classes here. It's, it's complex. I don't like this. It's hard to understand. And the other team says, well, if I have just one giant class, that's not going to be maintainable. I think there's elements to truth to both of these statements. But the problem was, they were looking to me to define some standard. Well, you're the architect. Can you just tell us what the system, you tell us how to design it and we'll design it. Uh, we, don't, we don't like this conflict. Uh, really what they're saying is, is work harder. Do more, do more. And what I started getting to the point was I needed to be really in a thousand places at once. I, I needed to be looking at everyone's work. I needed to be kind of running around and and, and seeing, you know, what are you doing? Oh, that's not consistent with what these guys are doing, and I need to, to fix this problem. And I remember at one point I actually realized that I was terrified of taking a vacation because if I left for any period of time, well, there, all these mistakes are going to get made, and, and, and I can't do that because then I'm going to have to fix them, and we're going to have to do all this rework, and yeah, this was not fun. So what we'd really got into a situation was that I, I'd become a, a single point of failure on the project. I'd become a bottleneck for decision making. And not only that, it relied on my skills and decisions to be really, really good. Because if I was wrong, it was going to be really costly. 
So the other kind of question is, what if I am wrong? And if I was wrong, how would I even know? And in fact, what we found out a few months into the project that there was a pretty major problem with our architectural approach. It was a, it was, there was a, a part of the architecture was extremely unmaintainable and we realized that if we were to continue this approach in the long term, it would com be completely unsustainable and we had to do a ton of rework and, and take a new direction. And I had some conversations with some people about this and I was kind of like, well, like, what do you think about this? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, this, this doesn't make any sense. Well, wait, how long have you known that? I kind of suspected this a while ago. Why didn't you bring it up? Well, you're the architect. I just assumed you knew something I didn't. I thought you had a really good reason for doing it this way. Oh, okay. Well, what was happening was when I was doing the design, when I'm doing the architecture, there was all sorts of assumptions that are being built in. But the teams weren't aware of these assumptions. They, and, and what I wasn't seeing was the detailed work. I wasn't in the weeds realizing that all these assumptions I'd built in were being completely invalidated in the day-to-day -day work. Because they weren't aware of the assumptions, they had no way of communicating to me or knowing that this was the thing that they, I should question. There was a, a study done recently, I think there was a TED talk on this, that they found that, that medical teams, they did, they did a study of a whole bunch of medical teams, and they were trying to find out what was the key element in the high performing medical teams, the teams that were really successful. And, and there was a weird element to them that, that the teams that were the highest success were the ones that made the most mistakes. And that didn't quite seem right, so they dug deeper, and what they really found was it wasn't the teams that made a lot of mistakes, it's a, the ones that brought up a lot of mistakes. The ones that communicated to their team because they understood what was going on and they didn't feel uh, uh, uncomfortable telling the team these things, but w I'd create an environment where the architecture couldn't be questioned, the architect couldn't be questioned, and the team didn't understand the context of the work they were doing. So what we really had here was a people problem. This isn't a technical problem, this, this is a leadership challenge, and I, I, this was when I really started coming to this realization that the architect role is more than just a technical role, that there's a real fundamental human people component to this. And so I'm a, I'm a software developer. I'm, my trade is to tell computers how to work, solve technical problems. I was finding technical solutions to what I thought were technical problems, but really what we have is a people problem. Um, I love this XKCD comic. This is a, a guy who's an engineer as well, and he's trying to solve the equation for love using math. Uh, this is probably how I would do it too. Uh, my normal approach is useless here. So my view up until now on leadership was fairly one-dimensional. I kind of thought that you either, you know, you have the, the, the drill sergeant who tells people exactly what to do, or we have our, our agile empowerment where leaders take their hands off the wheel and just let the teams self-organize and decide. Um, but neither of these was working. So I had this problem, how do I serve teams without just telling them what to do? I need to, I need to help them build this architecture, the system, but when I just give answers, people will just follow it whether they make sense or not. Um, fortunately, I had a lot of leaders in my organization who could coach me. They provided me a lot of resources. I got a lot of support here. One of the, one of the resources that uh, was pretty, pretty powerful, pretty impactful on me was this book by uh, David Marquet, Turn the Ship Around. So Marquet was a submarine commander, and in 1999, he took command of a ship, a uh, submarine called the Santa Fe. And he had, he had six months to get this ship ready for deployment. The problem he had, though, was that he'd been given this assignment at the last minute. He'd actually been preparing to take command of a completely different submarine, one that had different technical specifications, different standards, and there's no way that he was going to be able to get that ship ready if it relied on his ability to give the right orders at the right time because he just wasn't going to be able to understand the technical specifications of that ship fast enough. So David understand, understood that in organizations we, we often funnel 
information to those who are the decision makers, those in the authority positions, whether it's the, you know, the, the VP or the architect or the manager or the product manager or whoever. We, 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 we funnel information to them so that they can make really good decisions. And you'll see, you'll see leaders do this. They'll go into meetings and they'll just sit there and they'll ask lots of, lots of questions and then they'll make the decision meeting over. So, how, instead, rather than moving information to the authority, how, do, how about we distribute the authority to those with the information? Because then we can make fast decisions, we can, we can respond quickly to new information, and those who have the information are gonna make better decisions. So, I like this quote, leadership is not what you achieve in the moment, leadership is what others achieve the moment you leave. So, if you're terrified to go on vacation because you think everything's going to fall apart, uh, then I think that, that maybe uh, you're not meeting this. And, and this was definitely the case for me. So the other thing David realized was that if you want to take your hands off the wheel, if you want to give up control and give authority, you need, you need a little bit more. Because if we're in a situation where if I take my hands off the wheel and everything falls apart, well then empowerment is not going to give us a good result. We need something more. So he, he identified these two pillars. And in order, in order to divest control, we need to develop the technical competence in those doing the work, and we need to create organizational clarity. So do people know, uh, do they have skills in, in good software design? Do they know TDD? The day-to-day -day, uh, uh, um, knowledge, do they have knowledge of, of enterprise architecture, of distributed systems, of, of database concurrency? They need to have all this knowledge. And the other thing they need is to have the understanding of all the assumptions that are going into the architectural decisions. They understand why we took this approach so that they can know when to question it and when to try something different. And once you have those two things in place, then you can really hand over control to your team. So David he, he, Marquette, he made, a, he made a pledge to never give another order. Instead of giving orders, he replaced it with intent. So he would communicate what, the, what his intent was, and then rather than for permission to things, they would communicate to him what they intend to do. And, and this is pretty powerful. Um, and, and actually, I, I give you guys all a task. Next time you're thinking of asking your boss for permission to do something, instead, instead say, um, I'm, I'm gonna intend to do this, and here's why. Here's, wh here's what went into my decision. And a lot of times, when managers or leaders see people do that, what they actually see is, man, this is someone who's really taking ownership of their work. And this is, this is actually something we don't encourage enough, I think. So Marquette's, Marquette's book kind of opened up a new, a new dimension to how I think about things. Um, so this is great, this is from Spotify. A lot of you have probably seen this. I kind of had this, this one-dimensional view down here. We either, you know, have 100% control or we have 100% autonomy, but we knew that didn't work. So Marquette's concept of organizational clarity is very similar to this concept of alignment. And what we really want to do is figure out how to get people up here. Excellent technical skills, I'm aligned on what the system is, and I have the autonomy to figure out how to deliver it. So how do I do that? And so took a new approach to this architect. We viewed me more, rather than more as the scout, now I'm more of a coaching role. I'm gonna help build, help develop the skills and understanding and the people who are doing the work so that they can make the decisions. We wanna divest the decision making. So one of the things we did, we formed this daily design meeting. We realized we needed to do some catch up because the teams didn't have this knowledge. So we invested 30 minutes every day where a technical lead from everyone from each team would meet and we would talk about challenges that the teams are having and we'd work through them together as a team. We would discuss how would, how would you solve this problem and what came up was all sorts of realizations that we were totally not on the same page. Um, and then one, once, once we came to a conclusion, we wanted to avoid that this team became the new, new authority so the technical lead would bring their, the, the, one, the technical lead that brought the challenge from their team, they would bring it back to their team and they would repeat the exercise. We wanted to reinforce that the teams themselves are the ones that own their decisions. Okay, this, was a, this, is, this is a good suggestion from uh, Marquet's book, resist the urge to provide solutions. So a big part of my job was usually I'd be sitting in my office, somebody would come by, they have a problem, they have a question, and I'm a problem solver. That's, that's 
that's, that's who I am, that's kind of part of my nature, so I want to solve problems, so when you bring me a problem, I'm going to give you an answer. Uh, but every time I do that, I'm communicating to the person across from me that I own the architecture. I'm the decision maker, I'm the decider. So resist the urge to provide solutions. But we have to replace that with something. So what I started doing was, if someone came to me with a problem, I'd, I'd sit there and I'd, I'd talk to them, I'd, I'd partner with them to solve the problem, I'd understand, you know, what, would, what, what solutions have you already considered? Why would you choose this one over that one? I might, I might ask some questions about some things they hadn't thought of, but what I really want them to do is I want them to walk away from that meeting owning the decision that they made. Okay, and what's in, what was really interesting about this is after, after a while of doing this, people would, would already know that I was gonna ask these questions. They'd approach me in my office and they'd already have things prepared. They'd say, okay, here's a problem I'm having. Uh, here's some things I've thought of. Uh, you know, I really like this idea uh, because of these reasons. I think this was one of the better ones, and this is what I intend to do about it. Not, they're not asking me permission. They're telling me what they intend to do. And we got to a point where I could just basically say, yeah, that sounds great. So in, in these meeting, in, in these discussions, in the meetings, I'd ask a lot of questions. The questions I ask communicate values. Which of these solutions is going to be the easiest to accommodate change in the future? What are the impacts on, on performance, on reliability? What do I want you to think about when you're, when you're designing the system? And the questions I'm asking are communicate to them what I think you should think about when you're building the system. Okay, so the last, the last kind of part about this is going from a position of, of building a system I, I've personally invested a lot in the development of this product, and now I'm having to really, really take my fingers out of the weeds and, and let people make decisions that maybe are not always the best, realizing that, that mistakes are gonna be made, and letting go, letting go of control was very hard for me, but I know that I've been in meetings where I've done this facilitator thing and I've been asking the leading questions but I've really got in the back of my mind, like this is the answer I want everyone in this room to come to. Everyone in that room knows that I'm trying to get them to that answer. That's not really the same thing as letting go of control. So, okay, uh, one thing I wanna say is that this, this design meeting didn't come without any problems. Um, we did get some jealousy from those kind of out of 10. This kind of became the new like expert authority meeting. Man, these are the smart guys. I wanna be in that meeting. Why can't I be in that meeting? Um, and not only that, we, we still had some conflict between teams. We were divesting control to the teams themselves, and the teams were taking ownership of their decisions, but the teams themselves weren't always agreeing, and you could see some conflicts continuing. Um, and the last one is, is we were still having this problem that this design group was still kind of seen as a design authority. So that was a challenge that was hard to overcome. Um, so the main thing I want to talk about now is the, the conflict. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with Conway's law. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structure of the organization. So if this is our communication structure, and really now it's, it's not me, it's five people in the middle here, then can we really be surprised that we can, we're gonna build a system that's, that's you know, got modules being built, they're all built very, very inconsistently and, are not, and not communicating well with each other? Um, so how do we solve this problem? Okay, I'm just gonna skip past this. So, one of the things we did, that, and I would actually say that this was, a, this was a side effect, this was not the intent that we were going for. We, we developed these sort of design steps. This was a framework to have discussions within our design meeting. And the reason we, we created this is because a lot of our design meetings were turning into arguments. People would you know, get really attached to an idea they would have. I'm sure everyone's been in a meeting where someone's like arguing tooth and nail for the idea they came up with, they're very attached to it. Um, I, I get pulled into this really easily. Um, and what we tried to do was develop an algorithm. I mean, we're, we're, we're programmers, we like to develop algorithms, so we could create an algorithm to solve this problem. This was a framework for having these meetings to pull us out of this, this positional argument. So, so at the start of every, uh, you know, someone would bring a problem, We'd make sure everyone understands what is the problem we're trying to solve. This is gonna keep us focused, because we'd go down rabbit holes. Um, then we go into solution mode, idea mode, where everyone, everyone is allowed to throw ideas onto the table. And we'd actually 
put them on the whiteboard. Everyone's ideas are on the whiteboard. They're all equal. And there's actually something interesting about us, about us all standing back separated from ideas. Now we're physically separated from the idea I came up with and all the ideas are equal. And the last thing is we, we did objective analysis of each of them. Why is this one a good idea? Why is this one a bad idea? And okay, so something I'd give you a try. If somebody's, if somebody's arguing with you and they're really arguing for a point, ask them, well, what's a, what, what is one thing about that you don't like? Everyone had to talk about everything that's good about other people's ideas and everything that's bad about their ideas. And what this does is it pulls people into interest-based thinking. We're thinking about what are, we, what are the outcomes we're trying to accomplish rather than what, are, what, what is the idea I want to win. So this is a, something I actually realized recently is that we basically reproduced Edward de Bono's six thinking hats minus the feelings one, um, which I actually think maybe could have helped. Um, so Edward de Bono's thinking hat is objectives, let's define the problem, let's, go into fa let's, let's identify facts, um, ideas, positive and negative outcomes, and then arrive at a conclusion and agree together. So what this does is it pulls people into parallel thinking and we, we're all in the same mode and it, it, it's a conflict resolution framework. So what's interesting is what we, what we developed as a way to, to stop fighting in that meeting actually turned into a way to help the teams themselves get along better. Because what started happening was the, the technical leads would go back to their teams, they'd use the same framework. And people started realizing that when we talk in this way, we're not fighting anymore and everyone feels better. And, if we, and I've actually been in meetings where, where me and another guy, we'd be, we'd be fighting and then, and then someone would say, why are we not doing that thing again? This doesn't feel right. And we kind of all tend to migrate back to this, this way of discussing. What's interesting is now this framework of having conflict resolution was embedded within all of the teams. And all of the teams had this common understanding that if we're going to disagree, this is how we're going to resolve it. One of the biggest reasons that people avoid conflict is because they don't know how the other person's going to react when I bring something up. But if I know exactly how they're going to react, if I know exactly the conversation we're going to have and I have a history of positive outcomes of having conflict, then the framework for having this, co this, this common framework for resolving these became a, a avenue to have better communication paths between the team. This was not something I expected to happen. This was a surprise and I was, I was very pleased about it. Okay, so this is kind of a, I'm going faster than I thought. Um, last point, disagreement is a mechanism for organizational clarity. So conflict is not just something we have to resolve, but what we realized is when we disagree, when we have deep disagreement, that's actually when we, we are the most uh, misaligned. And these are opportunities for us to, to get better and deeper understanding of the assumptions and reasons behind the architecture. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a problem, one of the team members, uh, one of the teams brought to our design meeting, and we realized there was really two options. We could, we could put some business logic in the domain layer, or we could put it in the database. And we had this discussion in the meeting, and everyone's pretty well aligned within that group, that business logic belongs in the domain layer, that's the most cohesive for the system. Um, so we came, we came to that agreement, but the, so I technically brought it back to his team, and the team repeated the exercise. We want the team to own their decision, great. They came to the complete opposite conclusion. And what we realized, we wanted to dig deeper, we wanted to understand what was going on here, that there were, there were members of that team that had a very strong database background, and they felt very strongly that you know, database integrity is the most important thing, we should, we should optimize that against everything else. So, my initial impulse reaction, well, we should just get them in line. The, you know, the design teams decided we should, we should enforce the standard, the, the architecture says business logic goes in the domain layer, you should put the business logic in the domain layer. But if I, if I look at this situation through my sort of new lens, my new leadership lens, my new way of thinking, I'm realizing that really what we're missing is, is one of our pillars. There's this, this lack of organizational clarity around what we should be thinking about in our architecture. So 
what, what, we, what we did, the way we resolved this was we actually brought the members of that team to our design meeting. We actually spent the next week in the meetings having pretty intense discussions about, about all the things that led up to where the architecture is. That, uh, we, we looked at all the things, um, the reasons we made the decisions. We really wanted to make sure that we weren't missing something. Maybe they were right. Maybe database, may, maybe the database was the right way to put it. Um, what we came to the conclusion of, everyone realized that, that yes, this was an important thing, but when weighed against the other factors, there was other things in our project that were more important. So we did end up reinforcing our architectural approach, but we, what came out of it was multiple people who had a deeper understanding of the why behind it. And we had much deeper commitment within our group and across teams in the approach we were taking. Okay, so the end, hey, we're all a big happy family, right? So something interesting happened. It, I love surprises because they teach me something. We've gotten to this point. All the teams are getting along. We've got these great communication paths forming between the teams. But then there's little old me. <laughs> Am I even needed anymore? Um, which, it's a little scary. Because <laughs> does that mean I don't have a job anymore? Um, actually, it turned out to be a really good thing. Um, and I'll, I'll, so I'll get to that in a second. But we, we realized that, yeah, my, my role wasn't really needed. We'd come to the point where we were having our daily design meetings and people were already coming to conclusions, they were solving things on their team. If they realized they needed another team uh, to solve it, they'd just, you know, they'd pull the people in, they'd have these design discussions, they'd come to our daily meetings and really it just became a reporting mechanism. Hey, hey, hey architect guy, here's the things we decided, what do you think? And I just kind of became a, yep, looks good, looks good, looks good. Well, you don't really need to pay someone to do that. So we migrated to this approach of, of uh, full, full divestment of the architecture, the, of the control of the architecture. The teams themselves own the designs. Um, so, okay, so what happened to me? Um, I actually, you put yourself out of a job and opportunities open up, so I'm actually in a leadership role now in a different uh, group and part of the organization, so this has been a really good, uh, this whole thing was a growing experience for me. I learned a lot about leadership, which has now opened up new opportunities. So, put yourself out of a job, it's a good thing. Um, Okay, so just kind of a review. We started out here, this idea that we need full autonomy, but we didn't really have this alignment or the skills. I migrated to this low autonomy thing. I'm just gonna give you the answers. What we tried now is, is okay, we still have the architecture. This is still the approach, but let's start building the skills and understanding of the team. And eventually we migrated into our happy place where the, the design and ownership the ownership of the designs is shared amongst all the teams. One thing I learned from this whole thing, your approach has to evolve. The, the architecture scout role, I believed, served a purpose when we did it. The architecture coach served another purpose. Eventually, we realized we didn't need this role at all. That doesn't mean that we would just jump straight to doing the architecture coach if we did this again. Maybe. Maybe we have to resurrect these roles again in the future. Maybe there's some new role that we hadn't even thought of that we're gonna need again, but we needed to continuously inspect and adapt what we were doing and try different things. So some learnings for me, the empowerment. It's more than just taking your hands off the wheel and letting go. Uh, you need to give people support. Um, lead through intent. Don't just, don't just give answers, uh, build understanding. Uh, Explain the why, what, why are we doing this? What, what is the architectural intent? Resist those urge to provide solutions. Partner with people, help them take ownership of the decisions they're making and help them come to those conclusions. Create a framework for disagreements and the framework itself can help to go navigate conflict but if it's common across the organization it can actually create this, uh, this emergent behavior of, of better relationships across all the teams. And the last one, uh, when, when conflict happens, when there's major disagreements, celebrate that because you're about, to, you're about to delve deeper and get a deeper understanding across your organization. It's a really good thing. So I have, what, 10 minutes left uh, for questions. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, is there any questions? Do we have a do we have a like a hand mic?
like uh, the architect should involve in the solution discussion or uh, the he needs to review it later. I mean, is it better to involve in the solution discussion or it should be once the solution, let the team figure out the solution and let review later. I mean, wh what is that better? Sorry, can you say slower? Um, I'm sorry. I'm not quite <laughs> following. Yeah. I mean, the solution, I mean, team will discuss uh, among them and come up with a solution. Or we should, I mean, architect should involve in that team discussion right. or he should be sit outside and review right. those things. Okay, so yes, the, the I think the question is, is is should the architect, or the architect be involved in that team discussion? I said absolutely, because that, that is the opportunity that I had to, to teach, to build understanding, um, to ask leading questions, to communicate the values through the questions I'm asking. That is the key point that I did a lot, the, the most of my work in, in building that. Thanks. Any of the architectural decision which you wanted, you, you, you showed that, okay, you had to, convince people for almost a week for uh, going for some decision. But during the phase of like, you know, sprinting, this week itself is like, you know, too long for them to digest that decision. So how do we enforce them to like, you know, get to any decision? How do you enforce decisions? Once we arrived at this, it didn't seem to be a, a factor. People, <laughs> People don't want to be misaligned. They don't want to be on a different page. This is what I saw is that is that actually once you had the 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 way of of resolving these disagreements, people naturally wanted to do that. They they the reason they avoided it in the past is because conflict is uncomfortable. Conflict's bad. I disagree. I disagree with you. That's fine. I'll just do my thing because that's the easiest thing to do. Once you create the framework so that they can resolve that, I never encountered a person who didn't want to do that. Who who just like that I had to tell them what to do, it just sort of got better. That's been my experience. Your mileage may vary. Uh, second question, uh, being the uh, architect lead, uh, you have to like, you know, take care of like, you know, how each team is progressing from their uh, thought process about what is the problem they are solving. So how do you keep that in line with what you are thinking from whatever product you are trying to build as an architect? I, I, I had to lean heavily on the, the technical leads, and, and I wouldn't say the leads. These were the people that had the, the strongest understanding, the, the strongest technical skills. I can't be everywhere at once. And, and this, is, this is what you're saying, is it's really, really hard to keep track of all these things. Um, that's just not something one person can do, I believe. So the way we got there was, was Step one was really developing the competencies of this smaller group of people so that they could go back and then the teams themselves can sort of self-regulate. I think I've got time for a couple more questions. So, uh, we talk about the system architects here, but there is a chain of business architect, enterprise architect. So how we can build that connection? So it is team level I have built an architect team, right? But I don't know how the business architect is thinking, right? So how we can build those connections? Um, so here, I'll let you hold the mic. I don't need a mic. I've got one. Um, I don't have a lot of experience outside of this context. I haven't wor I haven't worked in like the enterprise architecture scale, so I don't want to I don't want to give you an answer. I don't understand. I don't really know. But I I believe that the principles of of building skills and 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 getting alignment, explaining why. If pushing that down as far down in the organization as you can. I recognize that there's times where not everyone can be involved in a decision. You get to a point where that, you, that just is not feasible to do. Um, but I think the principle of divesting control as far down the organizational structure, I, 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 I've seen this um, with user stories as well. Right? It's, it's the, here's the here's the requirements, I'll just implement them whether they make sense or not. A, 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 a product manager or a product owner who's communicating the intent behind the user story is going to have a much better long-term outcome because the team's going to understand why they're, they're making a lot of little decisions every day. So I think that this concept uh, scales to a lot of different situations, but I don't have that exact experience, so thank you. Sure, you first and then, okay, we'll do a couple more. So uh, you, you talked about that you have a design meeting. So my point there is, uh, you get away from your architect position and you created five more. So yep. 
that now I, you already talked about that every team I think oh why that person is there why not I then how uh, so I don't know whether you guys have solved that problem or is there any idea how do I solve that problem I don't want to create again these other people also go right. through the same way you went through um, so Marquette talked about this in a book because he, he said uh, he wants to create a ship where every person on that ship thinks like the captain. I would, I would like a, a, a team where every single member of the team is thinking like the architect. And that's a long-term goal. Um, it takes a lot of investment in people in people development and in, in skills development. Um, but that is the ultimate goal, is to, to really have everyone having that solid understanding. Um, uh, did, I ask, did I answer your question? Uh, to some extent, I was trying to figure out uh, that uh, the, the the problem you try to solve that not, not single person dependency now another person get into right. the same same problem right. at, so, at, so at least at least then we had one person on no, each team uh, that, that, that I agree that, that I agree right. you moved one right. step further but yeah uh, so the other thing I was developing was the leadership skills of those individuals so that they could repeat that task yeah. within their team that makes sense yeah. I'll agree why don't we do one more okay uh, simple question as you discussed, uh, you have a conflicts regarding when we need to implement it on database level or module level, right? Uh, suppose uh, you have decided that now you have decided that uh, it will be implemented on module level. So after that, do we need to create some guidelines, some document guidelines, so that in the future also we not need to need not to discuss same thing again? Yeah, we we had some very light documentation about that. Um, no one read it. <laughs> Just didn't happen. And, and I don't know if that's just because um, people don't like reading documentation, or the second one is just that the knowledge was so dispersed throughout the team that it wasn't needed. That if you had a conversation with someone, they'd be like, oh, remember, remember that that's not where we put stuff. Okay, yeah, you're right. And it became like a self-sustaining knowledge base, that the team itself, a lot of times I think we produce architecture because we're worried that if that person disappears, that knowledge is gonna disappear. Well, if everyone's got the knowledge, and I know that I know that's not really like that's an extreme case. There's going to be si there's still going to be some silos of knowledge, but let's let's avoid single points of failure and things like that. So yeah, uh, basically, it happens uh, with uh, within our team. Um, we discussed and we decided to go with this one. And after that, uh, we don't have any uh, guideline over it. So after that, we have discussed same thing again, and we have decided like that again. Right. We'll do need to do this thing. Right, right. So in the future, also some other developer comes in. And then again, we have a discussion like that. So we need to have some guideline, right? Mm -hmm. So that uh, we can refer it and. Yeah, yeah, and, and I don't have a problem with that. Like that doesn't, I think having some light documentation about you know the general, like how did we arrive here and like a historical document, but I've never seen that done well. If you, if you, if, if you see a way that that can be done, they always get lost, like the people forget it exists. It doesn't get updated when new decisions are made. Um, okay, thank you. Um, if I, I'm going to stick around afterwards if people want to talk, um, but I want to be respectful of people's lunch time because lunch is starting now. So um, I'll just be up at the front if people want to talk about this more. I want to. I'm curious to hear more about other people's experiences. Um, I want to learn if the, if you think this would apply to you. If you think it wouldn't, that would be very beneficial to me. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>